One of the reasons that we really like experiments over observations is the fact that we can use a carefully designed experiment to prove something. We can show that something causes something else by uh, being careful in the way that our experiment is designed. A problem with observational data is we can't prove anything with observational data. We can show relationships, but not cause. As a kind of silly example here, let's suppose that we're recording and we find that the number of boating accidents and the number of uh, popsicle sales both go up at similar times. And so one of the problems with observational data is this would mean that, let's say, increased popsicle sales are going to lead to increased boating accidents, or increased boating accidents are going to lead to increased popsicle sales. And that seems kind of silly. What we have here is an example, even though both of these are related, we have what's called a confounding variable in the background. In this case, boating accidents and popsicle sales go up at the same time because it's summer, right? People like having their popsicles, people are out on the water, and when you're out on the water, there inevitably um, are accidents. So as we go through, you've got to be really careful when you're looking at observational data to not talk about cause, um, but just to talk about relationships between how those work. An experiment allows us to isolate things that are going on, but we have to accept we have to set up our experiment carefully. The only thing that is required definition-wise for an experiment is that the researcher is going to assign a treatment. That doesn't prove anything very well. Um, so what a lot of times for a good experiment, what we'd like to do is introduce what we call a control group. A control group is a group that gets normal behavior. And then you're going to compare that to our treatment group. By isolating what's happening, we want both of our groups to be as similar as possible with as many char similar characteristics as possible. But being able to say, if everything else is the same except for this treatment, then we know that this treatment is the cause. Uh, one of the most common types of um, situations where we can really see this is an example of a lot of medical experiments or pharmaceutical experiments, where maybe you're going to give aspirin to one group and not to the other group, and then they can uh, rate the value of their headaches, for example. And that way we are able to control or compare um, the group that gets the medication or not get medication. And the one that's getting the more normal, usual behavior is our control group. Now you need to be careful. Uh, there actually is are some interesting studies depending on what types of things you're measuring uh, that sometimes people just feel better if they think they're being helped. Um, and so we have can introduce in terms of medical experiments, we have these control groups, but we can also introduce what we call a placebo control group. In a placebo control group, rather than giving uh, nothing, right, for your control group, like getting a medication or not getting a me medication, in a placebo control group, the control group gets something that looks like the treatment.
So for example, maybe I'm going to give, I'm going to, everybody is going to get a pill in both the control group and not the control group. One of the pill has an active ingredient like aspirin and then the other group is going to get a pill that doesn't do anything. So maybe just uh, a lot of times they call them a sugar pill or something like that, where it doesn't have any of the active ingredients, but both groups are going to go through the process of taking the pill. That way we overcome any of this, uh, this mental uh, association with just because I got a pill, I feel better. Um, and so you could actually run an experiment where you have a placebo control group, a control group where they get no medication and then the control group that gets the actual medication. And so you can kind of do these layers to try to eliminate as many factors as possible to get the most accurate reading. Um, so this idea of a placebo where that we, we can kind of, where, where the person doesn't really know if they're getting the treatment or not, ends up being a really good way to get uh, more solid and valid results when you're doing uh, when you're doing your experiments. Uh, let's see what other vocabulary things do we have here when we're talking about experiments. Um, other types of things that can affect the experiment is going to be um, who knows that the experiment is going on. So some other uh, ways that we can devise experiments is we can have things called a blind experiment. In a blind experiment, the person receiving the treatment or the group, it doesn't have to be a person, I suppose, but that whoever is receiving the treatment can't tell if they're in the treatment group or not. This seems like a, a, good, uh, a good way that we can account for kind of the, this placebo effect that we have here. Uh, sometimes it's impossible to design a blind experiment. For example, if you want to uh, study a, the effect of an exercise plan, it's going to be very difficult to uh, have one group that's in the exercise plan and one group that's just not getting uh, that exercise plan and comparing them, right? Um, they're gonna know which group they're in. Uh, but if there's something that we can do so that they don't understand which group they're in, like giving everyone a pill that looks the same, but they don't know what's going on, obviously the researcher knows who's getting what, right? Another type of well-designed experiment, if you can pull it off, is a double blind experiment. In this person, the person receiving the treatment can't tell if they're in the group or not. That's the blind part. The double blind means that the person evaluating or measuring the result doesn't know which group they're in. Now, why would this matter? Let's say that you are a physician uh, and you know which group is receiving the medication. If you have positive feelings uh, about and hopefulness about a particular medication, you might record certain symptoms a little bit differently if you knew that that person uh, was taking that, that pill or not. Because a lot of these types of things are subjective when you're trying to make some of these measurements, right? You're asking how people are feeling or you're trying to interpret uh, certain different signs. So if the physician knows who's getting a pill and who's not, they might be influenced by that in the way that they record the results. With the double blind experiment, the physician that's talking to them doesn't know. They're, it's just, I know you're taking some pill, let's talk about how you feel, right? And so you don't get any of that prejudgment associated with it when you head into uh, that discussion for the experiment. So a double blind experiment is uh, really good if you can pull that off. Of course, you do need to have someone know who's in which group, right? So the researcher on the back end, of course, would be uh, the one that would get this data from each person and they would be able to then make a match of whoever, um, had gotten the treatment versus not getting 
the treatment so that we get, can actually get that sort of a comparison group going when we get into there. And I think that goes through our uh, different qualifications of types of experiments. And again, the, the more of these that you can take into account, the better job you're doing of isolating the variable or treatment that you're trying to study. And then once you do that, then you can actually start working towards establishing cause. Otherwise, we're just establishing relationships, uh, which is useful, but not necessarily always helpful, like our voting accident popsicle sale um, discussion earlier. <laughs>